most about running extreme marathons is the fact that you come into close contact with nature. The races take place in beautiful settings such as mountains, deserts, glaciers. As a professional athlete, I hadn't been able to enjoy these surroundings because I was so, so focused on winning medals. I found out about the Marathon des Sables by chance. I had already retired from the pentathlon when a good friend said to me, there's this amazing marathon in the desert, but it's very tough. I, I love a challenge, so I started training immediately, running 40 km a day, uh, reducing the amount of water I was drinking to get used to uh, dehydration. I was never home. My wife, uh, Cynthia, she, she thought I was insane. The race is so risky that you have to sign a form to say where you want your body to be sent in case you die. And we had three children under the age of eight, so she was worried. I tried to reassure her. The worst thing that can happen is that I get a bit sunburned, I said. Well, when I arrived in Morocco, I discovered a marvelous thing. The desert. I was bewitched. These days, the Marathon des Sables is a very different experience with up to 1,300 participants. It's, it's like a giant snake. You couldn't get lost if you tried. But back in 94, uh, there were only 80 of us and very few who were actually running so, you know, most of the time I was on my own. Things went wrong on the fourth day, during the longest and most difficult stage of the race. When we set out that morning, there was already quite a bit of wind. I had passed through four checkpoints. When I entered uh, an area of sand dunes, I was alone. The pacemakers had gone ahead. Suddenly, a very violent sandstorm began. The wind kicked in with terrifying fury. I was swallowed by a yellow wall of sand. I, I was blinded. I, I couldn't breathe. The wind uh, and, and the sand whipped my face. It was like a storm of needles. I understood for the first time how powerful a sandstorm could be. I turned my back on the wind and wrapped a scarf around my face to stop the sand from wounding me. I wasn't disoriented, but I had to keep moving to keep from getting buried. <laughs> uh, eventually, I crouched down in a sheltered spot, waiting for the storm to end. It lasted eight hours. When the wind died down, it was dark, so I slept out on the dunes. I was upset about the race because until then, I had been in fourth place. I woke up uh, very early to a transformed landscape. I didn't know I was lost. I had a compass and a map, so I thought I could navigate perfectly well. But without points of reference, it's a lot more complicated. I wasn't worried because I was sure that sooner or later I'd meet someone. Who knows how many others are in the same situation? I thought, as soon as I see someone, we can team up and get to the finish together. That, that was my plan, but unfortunately, it didn't work out. After running for about four hours, I climbed up a dune and still couldn't see anything. That's when I knew I had a big problem. I started to walk. What was the point of running? Running where? When I realized I was lost, the first thing I did was to urinate in my spare water bottle. Because when you're still well hydrated, your urine is the clearest and the most drinkable. I remember my grandfather telling me how, during the war, he and his fellow soldiers had drunk their own urine when the, their water ran out. I did it as a precaution, but I wasn't desperate, and I was well prepared. I had a knife, a compass, sleeping bag, and plenty of dehydrated food in my backpack. The problem was water. 
We were given fresh water at the checkpoints, but when the storm hit, I had only half a bottle of water left. I drank it as slowly as I could. On the second day, at sunset, I heard the sound of a helicopter coming towards me. I assumed it was looking for me, so I took out my flare, I shot it up in the air, but he didn't see it. It was flying so low that I could see the pilot's helmet, but he didn't see me. He flew right past. Nevertheless, I remained calm because I was convinced the organizers would have the resources to find anyone lost in the desert. I still thought I would be rescued sooner or later. After a couple days, I came across a marabout, a Muslim shrine, where Bedouins stop when they are crossing the desert. I was hoping it was inhabited, but unfortunately there was nobody there, only a holy man in a coffin. But at least I had a roof over my head. Uh, it was like being home. I assessed my situation. It wasn't rosy, but I was feeling all right physically. I ate some of my rations, which I cooked with fresh urine, not the bottled urine that I was saving to drink. I started to drink that on the fourth day. The marabout had uh, uh, filled up with sand from all the sandstorms, so the ceiling was very low. I went up to the roof to plant my Italian flag in the hope that anybody looking would, would see me. While I was up there, I saw some bats huddled together in the tower. I decided to drink their blood. I grabbed a handful of bats, cut their heads off, and mushed up their insides with a knife, then sucked them out. I ate at least 20 of them, raw. I had been in the Marabout for three days when I heard the sound of a motor, an airplane. I don't know if it was looking for me, but I immediately started a fire with whatever I had, my rucksack, everything, in the hope the plane would see the smoke. But just then, another sandstorm hit. It lasted for 12 hours. The airplane didn't spot me. I felt it was my very last chance to be found. I was very depressed. I was convinced I was going to die and that it was going to be a long, agonizing death. So I wanted to accelerate it. I thought if I died in the desert, no one would find me and my wife wouldn't get the police uh, pension. In Italy, if someone goes missing, you have to wait 10 years before they can be declared dead. At least if I died in this Muslim shrine, they would find my body and my wife would have an income. I wasn't afraid of dying and my decision to take my own life came out of logical reasoning rather than despair. I wrote a note to my wife with a piece of charcoal and then cut my wrists. I lay down and waited to die, but my blood had thickened and wouldn't drain. The following morning, I woke up. I hadn't managed to kill myself. Death didn't want me yet. I took it as a sign. I regained confidence and I decided to see it as a new competition against myself. I became determined and focused again. I was thinking of my children. I put myself in order. Uh, you know, the athlete was back. I needed to have a plan. I still had quite a lot of energy left. I wasn't tired. Uh, as a former pentathlete, I was used to training 12 hours a day and I had trained well for the Marathon des Sables, so I didn't feel too weak. I still had some energy tablets, too. I regained my strength and mental lucidity. I decided to get out of the shrine and start walking again, but where to? 
I followed the advice that Torreg had given us all before we started the race. If you're lost, head for the clouds that you can see on the horizon at dawn. That's where you will find life. During the day, they will disappear, but set your compass and carry on in that direction. So I decided to head for those mythical clouds on the horizon. I walked in the desert for days, killing snakes and lizards and eating them raw. And that way I drank, too. I, I think there are some instincts, a kind of deja vu, that kick in in an emergency situation. My inner caveman emerged. I wanted to see my family and friends again, and I, and I concentrated on that. I wasn't afraid. At the same time, I started to view the desert as a place where people can live. I, I could see the beauty of the desert. I paid careful attention to every trace. Uh, even dried excrement gave me clues about what direction to go in. Uh, I learned there's food all around you, if you learn to look. As I was walking through the desert, I recognized dried riverbeds where succulents grew. So I squeezed their juice and drank that. On the eighth day, I came across a little oasis. I lay down and drank sipping slowly for about six or seven hours. I saw a footprint in the sand, so I knew people couldn't be far. And the next day, I saw some goats in the distance. It gave me hope. Then I saw a young shepherd girl. She saw me too and ran away, scared. After nine days in the desert, I must have looked quite a sight. Uh, you know, I was, I was black with dirt. The girl ran towards a large Berber tent to warn the women I was coming. There were no men in the camp. They had gone to market, but the women took care of me. They were so kind. Uh, an older woman came out of the tent and immediately gave me some goat's milk to drink. Uh, she tried to give me some food as well, but I threw it up. They wouldn't allow me into the tent because I was a man, but they put me on a carpet in the shade of their veranda. Uh, then they sent someone to call the police. They like to camp close to military bases for protection. The police came and carried me to their jeep. They took me to their military base, blindfolded, because they didn't know who I was. They thought I might be dangerous. They had guns, and at times, I thought that they were going to kill me. When they found out I was the marathon runner who had got lost in Morocco, they took off my blindfold and celebrated. I discovered that I had crossed the border into Algeria. I was 291 kilometers off course. They took me to a hospital in Tindouf, where finally, after 10 days, I was able to call my wife. The first thing I said to her was, Have you already had my funeral? <laughs> because after ten days lost in the desert, you would expect someone to be dead. When they weighed me in the hospital, I had lost 16 kilograms. I weighed just 45 kilograms then. My eyes had suffered and my liver was damaged, but my kidneys were fine. I couldn't eat anything other than soup or liquids for months. It took, uh, it took almost two years to recover. Uh, but four years later, I was back at the Marathon des Sables. People ask me why I went back, but when I start something, I want to finish it. The other reason was that I can't live without the desert. Desert fever does exist, and it's a disease that I've absolutely caught. I'm drawn back to the desert every year to greet it, to experience it. Sport and nature are part of my life, and these races allow me to experience them firsthand. My wife was a saint. Uh, she coped with me for many years, but at a certain point, because of my lifestyle, we decided to split up. We are still best friends, uh, maybe more so now than when we were married. I have a new partner, but she knows I am a man on a mission. I can't change.